This is DW News Africa with a special broadcast coming to you from South Africa where three decades after the end of white minority rule, this is still very much a country of privileged whites and masses of poor black people. The gap between the have and the have nots is so wide, making this the most unequal society in the world. So what's gone wrong and how can it be fixed? I am at the Union Buildings in the capital, Pretoria, and this is the place where the late struggle icon Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as the first black president after the country's first democratic election in 1994. In the speech he gave on that day, Nelson Mandela talked about a country where every citizen would live a dignified life and be treated equally. But 27 years later, the status quo is very far from that. And that is because inequality has been growing in South Africa, and so has poverty, especially among black South Africans. Now, the country's welfare system, the social welfare system, is one illustration of that. 20 years ago, one in 10 South Africans were on welfare. Today, a third of the population, that's about 19 million people, depend on the state to survive. There's no hope in South Africa. People are going to suffer for a long time throughout the, the things that we're going through, through corruption and all that stuff. This disease, the COVID-19, has changed everything in South Africa. The unemployment rate, everything has just shut down. Because jobs, people are getting through uh, connections. If you don't have the right connections, there's no jobs. So, no, there's no hope. There is vaccine for everyone. But then still, some cannot even afford to go because of the standard of taxis. Everything is just so expensive. But then the government is trying. Since 94, I voted several times. But the promise was just this time, five years, will create a lot of jobs. But the more they have to be creating that jobs, is the more the jobs have been lost. A lot of investors have left this country really I don't understand what is, what is happening in this. Figures suggest as much as half of South Africa's population lives in abject poverty. That is, people lacking basic services like sanitation, water, health care and housing. Now that is poverty. Then there is also joblessness. This country has high levels of unemployment. In fact, the country has reached a record of 35% of unemployment. And then there's inequality. According to the World Bank, this is the most unequal society in the world as measured by the Gini coefficient. That inequality is still along racial lines where, for the most part, white South Africans are better off than their black South African counterparts. Now, you're about to meet two women, both of them 30. One is white and the other is black. And because of that, their lives are vastly different. Loli Kubeka was born and raised in Alexandra, a township in Johannesburg. She still lives in her childhood home and has become an inspiration in the community because she opened the first of its kind beauty spa here. My dad is now uh, staying in England. At first he was a taxi driver here in Alex. And then my mom was a petrol station uh, attendant, which he, you know, uh, he would, she would take me to work with her you know, at a young age, you know, if I didn't have a nanny to look after me. Growing up with both of my parents uh, and seeing them being hard workers and, you know, hustling for us with the little money that they uh, they earned. In the northern suburb of Rosebank, Elreta Bartlett, who also grew up in Johannesburg, has set up her private psychology practice where she uses play therapy to help children and adults deal with their emotions. I'm Arieta and I work as a psychologist. My dad worked as a church minister and my mom as a clinical social worker. We grew up on the church grounds, so we had quite a lot of space and it was quite safe. We could ride around of our bikes and run around with friends. There's a lot of uh, things that I saw in terms of uh, being a young girl growing up in, in the township. It's, it's not safe. There's so much teenage pregnancy, there's so much crime, there's uh, drugs involved. I would think we come from a middle class, probably upper middle class family. I had a lot of opportunities because of my family and the resources and, you know, and both of them also went to university. So they paid for my studies, but there's not an expectation that I support them. I started at a young age to, to be responsible and to try and, and bring bread uh, at my mom's house. I'd wish for one day to wake up with a million in my bank account and then 
buy them a proper house. My biggest dream was to set up my own practice and I did that. So I did that at the age of 29. I have a nice place where I live and I live in, I have a nice car, but when I drive around, it's visible that there's a lot of people that are living on the streets, a lot of people who struggle for survival. Uh, I think it creates, for me, it creates quite a lot of guilt. We're actually delivering good services and bringing great stuff in the community or in a township, Gomorrah, you know. You, uh, who, are, who would have thought that there's going to be a spy in Gomorrah, you know, it's just a township. So this is basically your typical white community. Here I've made a black community and there a Chinese community. So the white community I've put money, big house, um, there's achievements and trophies. I think it's, it's easier to, to gain opportunities um, in that community. I think many of the resources still lie there. I've also created a bit of a hill to show that they can see themselves as being a bit superior. Um, this family or this group are looking at that community. They kind of have their backs on them, um, but I think they are aware of the, the inequality. Global trends do show that inequality is increasing in both developed and developing countries all over the world. And that's been happening over the last several decades. But South Africa does stand out. Even though you have a black middle class that's emerged and is still growing, you also even have a small elite of black South Africans that have amassed serious wealth. The majority of black South Africans have not been able to escape the poverty trap. Now, Oxfam has done extensive research into this. Listen now to one of the project leaders in the South Africa office. In a report that we did at Oxfam, one of the things that we found is that in South Africa, um, it's actually determined at birth, the type of family that you're born into, the type of class that you're born into. If you're born into a low-income family, chances are that you will be in that um, class and that, uh, that, that income bracket for the rest of your life. The legacy of apartheid has continued and has been um, transferred from one generation to the next. When we transitioned into a democratic society, the wealth that was had by the few wasn't necessarily redistributed, right? So, for example, one of the things we advocate for um, at Oxfam South Africa is progressive tax reforms. So one um, such tax reform would be a wealth tax because the wealth that was concentrated by a few and was accumulated at the expense of the black majority wasn't necessarily redistributed into society. If the poverty and inequality is not addressed or measures aren't put in place to sort of reduce it, I think we will see social tensions um, and we will see, I think, high levels of you know civil unrest. Two months ago in July, South Africa experienced unrest not seen in the country in its 27 years of democracy. In fact, behind me, you can see some of the buildings that were looted and gutted in the violence. Very few businesses here in this township were actually spared. Now, while the unrest was triggered by the jailing of the former president, Jacob Zuma, it was fueled by the anger and frustration of the poor masses. Now, in a moment, I'll be talking to one the main voices in the country's opposition politics about that but first this report now on the days of looting and rioting and the blow that that dealt to the economy responding to an unusual threat from the masses security forces struggling to keep back the swarming crowds that raided businesses mainly in the provinces of Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal over 10 days, South Africa experienced its worst outbreak of violence since the end of apartheid. What happened here is very painful. We're trying to provide for our children, to pay their school and transport fees. But how will we do that now? I found my shop in this state, and all that I'm left with is this umbrella. Really, really, we do bad, we do bad. It's us to this, but this we do it bad. Because we got no shop now, where are you going to buy? As the looting carried on, many businesses were set alight. The government called in the army on a rare domestic deployment to restore order. And it's quite clear 
that this, all these incidents of unrest and looting were instigated. There are instigators, there were, there were people who planned it, they coordinated it, and our intelligence services and our police have now got a line of sight of what actually was happening here with the instigation. Instigation that followed the conviction of former President Jacob Zuma on contempt of court over a corruption trial. His supporters took to the streets in protest, but soon after, the situation deteriorated. We are now engaging with the constitutional court. There's been complete destruction of the livelihoods of people. People are now going to go forward having lost jobs, and the economic damage that has been done, including just looking at our country from both internal investors as well as external investors, as an economic destination has been severely dented. The total immediate damage to property and equipment has been worth an estimated $1 billion. The longer term effects, impossible to measure. My next guest used to be the leader of the country's main opposition, the Democratic Alliance or the DA. Musi Maimane has since launched his own political party. I sat down with him at his offices in Cape Town and I began by asking him what he made of the recent looting and riots. This was a constant ticking time bomb that for many people, the images we saw on screen brought back memories that I had as a child living in the 80s in Soweto, where we watched uprising, where we watched violence takes place. And therefore it felt like something in the muscle memory had been kicked in. We faced institutional failure from the perspective that here South Africa could not gather the appropriate intelligence, muster the appropriate response to be able to deal with the particular issues that, were, that it was presented with. Secondly, we could see a very failing political system because no one can deny the fact that many of these were triggered subsequent to the arrest of President Zuma, yeah. meaning that you immediately saw the factional play of the ANC and its demise playing out onto the streets where it was incapable of providing leadership. But the third dynamic is that overlaying the very strong criminal intelligence syndicate that had been captured to be able to execute so many of the attacks, young people were then available to be able to create the mass actions that could take place. How has this country got into this place? Well, first and foremost, I think all of us celebrate and were euphoric at the end of apartheid. It felt like we'd won a war, we'd gotten some peace. Now the question on the table is whether we can win the peace. There isn't always a national agenda that says, how do we broaden economic inclusion? Part of the pronouncement of our inequality in this country is that there are a few South Africans who are making extreme amounts of wealth and there are many South Africans yeah. who are living on less than, uh, on, are living below the upper poverty line. We watched you take on former President Jacob Zuma, um, very powerful man at the time, of course, president of the country. Um, what, what was that like? Just what did that take? And, and to those South Africans who have a hard time envisioning this country, uh, as you say, post the ANC, what is your message to them? We've lost our values as a country. And I thought President Zuma sat at the center of mismanaging those values. We saw not only corruption, but crass materialism that was offensive to poor people. President Zuma was at the heart of that. And that's what corruption effectively entrenches even more, is that it says if you are connected, you can get somewhere. And if you are not, then you find it difficult in this country. So, he represented a significant problem. But I always maintained that we didn't have a President Zuma problem, we had an ANC problem. And I felt that even at the time, post-President Zuma, it didn't matter who you brought on, on board. My hope is that the young people of this country will take up the destiny of this country. Realize that the ANC is asking questions of their parents, not theirs or their kids. And it's those young people who are the majority of this continent and the majority of this country 
who, given the opportunities, A, will vote for something new and something fresh, B, will ensure that we can put leaders in government who are future focused and not thinking about just the legacy of yesterday. And lastly, I think that the problems of South Africa are not insurmountable from the perspective that they are not natural disaster, they are human disasters. So to me, to that person, learn from the Kenyans. We must first be liberated and then we must liberate ourselves from the liberators. We have an opportunity now if we can reform the Electoral Act to directly vote for people who we can hold accountable and set up a democratic future for our country. Mr. Maimani, thank you very much. I'm in Africa's richest square mile. This is the Sanson Central Business District in Johannesburg. It is a mecca for high-end luxury shopping. It's also home to some of the continent's most expensive real estate. Now, because much of South Africa's wealth is still very much in the hands of the white minority, there are growing calls in the country to redistribute or reallocate the country's resources. Our correspondent, Adrian Krish, met some South Africans who propose what they call radical ideas to solving the country's inequality. South Africa's social divisions are clear to see here in Cape Town. It's home to some of the country's super rich, but the majority of the city's residents live in poverty. There's lots of talk about how bad the situation is, but what could actually be done to close the inequality gap? Pierre de Foss suggests, let's talk about getting rid of inheritance. Given that there has been 350 years of colonialism apartheid, in which white people had the benefit of accruing wealth, while black people were stopped from accruing wealth. There was, it, was a, it was not possible legally for black people to own property in most parts of the country. Inheritance is a way of perpetuating the inequality because uh, benefits are given from one generation to the next and it is a cumulative thing. So it, it really <laughs> perpetuates the unfairness, the, the racial unfairness. So my argument was we have to do something about that. We have to get away from just blindly supporting this. So at, at the very least, uh, uh, imposing a very high tax. There should be a threshold. So you can inherit up to a certain amount. And after that, everything is given to the state. Nzwane Moses' suggestion is even more tower. radical. He supports illegal land occupations yeah. and wants to take away land from white people and give it to black people. The big catch words here are always land expropriation without compensation. Yes. Do you think that would be the solution? How does it look like? Would you go to a white farmer and just take away his land and give mm. it to, to somebody else then? Mm. Yes. The solution. Yes, that's a solution. Because expropriation with compensation is a failed policy. That is why we are in this situation, because it doesn't work. We want the, the potential of our people to be unleashed. And the only way that that can happen is if we can get access to resources. I mean, the big issue is actually inequality. And I think we can both agree to say, like, mm. there's massive ine mm. uh, inequality. In and, and it's along racial lines. We must never forget that. Okay. Mm. But what would you say, how would it change the inequality issue if people had better access to land? Our people have ideas. Right. Our people have the passion to do things. When you look at the area that I live in, you can count the people who have jobs in this area. I was born in 99, exact same situation that my parents were in. I'm in a food bank just outside of Johannesburg and the food parcels you see around me here are going to be distributed to South Africans who were affected in the recent looting and riots. It's where I'm going to be talking to my next guest, Minister Lindiwe Zulu, the Minister of Social Development. She is responsible for this project. Now, she is also an ANC veteran who's held senior positions both in the party and in government. The ANC has ruled South Africa since the end of apartheid, but today many South Africans feel the party is no longer relevant and that it is incapable of fixing the country's problems. Within the ANC itself, there are different ideas and ideologies about how to go about correcting the imbalances of the past. And there is a huge faction today within the party calling for what's been dubbed radical economic transformation. I'm going to be asking Minister Zulu exactly what that is. It is about transforming the economy so that people of South Africa, in particular black people, can see themselves owning the economy of South Africa. It is about ensuring that we create a conducive environment for them also to feel that they are owners of the economy. It's about 
It's about them also ensuring that the land which everybody has been complaining about, and rightfully so, the, the, the land has been owned in the main by white people. And what the government of the African National Congress has done through our, our, our constitution, because everybody is protected by the constitution, by the way. So we didn't come in here and say, no, we want the land, we're taking the land, get out of the land. There is due process that would make everybody feel comfortable that we're not just grabbing the land for the sake of grabbing it. We're taking the land and giving it to those who were deprived of the land for decades. Minister, I've been reporting in South Africa for a long time and I've been hearing this from ANC ministers. We want to create jobs, we want to improve the lives of people. But it is 27 years and your party has been in power. You've said it yourself, this country has one of the highest unemployment rates, highest inequality rates. A lot of black South Africans are yet to be liberated economically. Why should South Africans trust that the ANC can deliver if it hasn't over all these years? 27 years is a very short period of time, yes, from a point of view of a government changing to be a government of the people and for the people. But also 27 years of changing the structural, uh, in a, in the structural challenges that are faced by the economy. It's going to take us a long time because still the production of the means of production are still almost owned by the same old. Now, 27 years of transforming that is a very short time. But of course, we appreciate that our people are wanting to see the change. But again, if we were to look at where we were 27 years ago and where we are right now, we think that we are in the right path. What are the timelines as to how you're going to be carrying that out? When are we going to see meaningful change? We cannot say it's going to be done within a short period of time because remember I said earlier on, we need to keep a balance that makes sure that the economy grows. By the way, we also need the international community to believe in us. So whatever we do, it's got to also resonate well with investors. It's got to resonate well with the world, and the world must understand. It is important for us to make sure that that transformation happens. There is a, an argument taking place or a conversation taking place on the continent now about whether or not the liberation parties are still relevant for present-day politics on the continent. Many people talk of the ANC in that context. Is the ANC still relevant? Do you, once a, a struggle icon essentially, st do you understand the struggle today? Or because you are now in upper echelons in society, perhaps there's a distance, you're able to talk about patients where you're not necessarily living in the conditions that people in Alexandra Township are, for example. I'm not talking about patience. I have not even asked people to be patient. It's not about us that liberated the country. It is about the young people finding the space for themselves. It is about us creating that space for young people. I can easily say to you, in 1976, when we stood up and said this and no more, we were young very, very young. But we didn't wait for somebody else to come and tell us that this is what we need to do. Right now, it is the time for the young people to ask themselves the question, what must the future look like? The African National Congress will remain as relevant as it is supposed to be as long as it responds to the needs of our people as of today, because we responded to the needs of our people when we removed the apartheid regime, which we realized was not helping our people. Today, the same thing. The African National Congress can only remain relevant if it responds to the people. Here's one quick example. It is the very same African National Congress that is listening to what people are saying about the issues of corruption. It is the very same organization that has enabled commissions to go and investigate what exactly is happening. It is the very same government of the African National Congress that has got systems institutions that are supposed to respond in fighting corruption. The ANC itself took a decision that if we had to fix the issue of corruption, we need to strengthen our institutions of governance, catch the culprits, lock them up, those that need to be locked up, get the money back from those that we need to get the money back. We are the ones that put the institutions in place to fight corruption. And that does it for this special broadcast of DEW News Africa. Today, we'll leave you with a series of drone images depicting the inequality in South Africa as it can be seen from high up top. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.